The first word from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. There they crucified him, the evangelist writes. Abandoned by his followers, rejected by his people, falsely accused, shamefully abused and mocked, the Son of God is condemned by sinners for sinners. Prior to lugging the crossbeam to the place of death, the victim was scourged with a vicious multi-thonged whip with balls of lead and sharp pieces of bone at its tips. The purpose? To make the blood flow, ensuring that the condemned would be in no shape to do anything but meekly comply with getting to the place of execution. In Jesus' case, the beating had so weakened him that he was unable to carry the heavy crossbeam so that Simon of Cyrene, coming in from the field, was compelled to carry the cross for Jesus. And as they were nailing him to the cross, Jesus speaks words, audible words, to those around him. The Greek tense indicates that Jesus repeated these words. Literally, he was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Oh, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. These are compassionate words. Words of forgiveness, a prayer. The Savior prays for them, that is, the them who've disowned him, the them who've handed him over, as well as the ones who are doing the crucifying, inflicting such pain, such torture upon him. And they fulfill the words of Isaiah, who said of the suffering servant, he interceded for the transgressors. Notice, too, that those for whom the Savior prays have no concern for him. They mock him. Yet Luke, who has portrayed for us the forgiving Savior, the one who has come to seek and to save the lost, reveals Jesus to be consistent even in his worst agony. Jesus' prayer includes the Jews who handed him over to Pilate, even for each one of us, who in our ignorance and self-will have wounded him. Shall we not trust that his forgiveness and his prayer for forgiveness covers us too? Gracious Father, forgive us. Far too often we know not what we are doing when we stray from your ways. Amen. We turn to him 447 to sing the first three stanzas, Jesus in your dying woes. There was also an inscription over him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? And we, indeed, justly, for we're receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. 
I tell you the truth, Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. The criminals crucified with Jesus, one on either side of him, joined in the verbal abuse of him, as the godless, the fearful, the tormented will often do out of anger, fear, and despair. Oddly, on one of them, though, the light of truth dawns. He sees the venomous hatred of those reviling Jesus, even amid his agony, and he comprehends that this man between them is innocent. He's just. He's righteous. But Jesus is even more, and the dying thief believes this. This can only be the work of the Holy Spirit of God. Conscience stricken, facing eternity, in his guilt and shame, he turns to Jesus in repentance and desperation and asks him to remember him when he comes into his kingdom. Jesus doesn't question the sincerity of his repentance, for wouldn't many convert under such circumstances? Nor does he burden the man with any word of condemnation, nor scold him for waiting so long to turn his life around. Instead, Jesus offers him pure hope. Pure hope. His words are unmistakable. Today you shall be with me in paradise. Paradise, the word to describe the Garden of Eden, the term for the place of bliss between death and the day of glorious resurrection. Jesus gives his blessing to the man. Today, after your agony of death, you will know peace and life. Jesus, remember us when you come into your kingdom. Amen. We sing stanzas four to six. Jesus, pitying the sighs of the thief who near you dies in paradise hear us holy Jesus may we in our guilt and shame still their love and mercy claim calling humbly on your name divine hear us holy Jesus standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby he said to his mother woman behold your son then he said to the disciple Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Woman, he said to his mother, there is your son. Then he said to the disciple, there is your mother. John describes a touching scene from the cross. As her eldest son, the welfare of Mary fell to Jesus. His siblings did not yet believe in him, but Mary knew and did. Here, lovingly, Jesus sees to it that his obligation as eldest son is fulfilled, and he delegates her care to John, who here, as elsewhere, declines to insert his name into the text, referring rather to himself merely as the disciple whom Jesus loved. There's a strong tradition in the early church that John took Mary with him to the very end, to Ephesus, where he ministered, lovingly doing that which Jesus charged him to do from the cross, caring for her to her earthly end as though he were her firstborn son. At such a time of agony, wouldn't it have been easier to ignore such familial duties or just to forget them or consider them unimportant? Yet here Jesus demonstrates still more of his self-sacrificing love, a love that looks beyond its own pain to be concerned for the benefit and well-being of others. 
Note how each of these first three words or statements of Jesus from the cross are concerned with the care and the welfare of others. Forgiveness, salvation, temporal care, others. Need we, need, need we further evidence of the sacrificial love of Jesus, the Christ for us? Dear Jesus, thank you for demonstrating true love for your mother, even in the midst of such pain. Help us to live such love, regardless of our circumstances. Amen. We join in stanzas seven through nine. Jesus, loving to the end, her whose heart your sorrows rend, and your dearest human friend, hear us, holy Jesus. May we in your sorrow share, for your sake all peril dare, and enjoy your tender care. Hear us, holy Jesus. Loved ones be all one holy family, loving since your love we see. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders, hearing it, said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait. Let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As the obedient, suffering servant of Isaiah, who is to atone for the sins of the world, Jesus experienced being utterly forsaken by God. Jesus' agonized cry is graphic proof that he bears the full weight of the sins of the world. He had such sweet fellowship with his Father. Indeed, he was one with the Father. Now experiences something totally foreign. The total and terrifying separation from his Father that sin, all sin, brings about. Nothing could be truly lonelier. With these words, the opening words of Psalm 22, which some bystanders mistake as a call for Elijah, Jesus cries out in horror at being forsaken of the Father. Now, in fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, he carries our griefs. He's pierced through for our iniquities, crushed for our crookedness, and the chastening for our well-being, our peace, has fallen upon him. He's so alone. And he feels it. Of all the agony Christ endures, none can compare with the torment of bearing the Father's full wrath as he carries the sin weight of the world, as he bears our iniquities. He truly has become sin for us. As St. Paul would write, God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. A blessed and grace-filled exchange indeed, him for us. Lord Jesus, what horror our sin laid upon you. Help us to regard our sin as abhorrent and to flee from it in all its forms and to seek to live in your righteousness. Amen. We sing stanzas 10 through 12. Fears unknown, with our evil left alone, while no light.
light from heaven is shown. Hear us, holy Jesus. be our stay. Hear us, holy Jesus. <clears throat> though no father seem to hear, though no light our spirits cheer, may we know that God is near. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. I am thirsty. What an understatement. After suffering innumerable torments, from bloody sweat to bleeding scalp, from crown of thorns to the flowing blood of the scourged and condemned one, Jesus says he's thirsty. He's been perhaps 15 or more hours without a drink since that last supper. One medical expert concludes that by this time, Jesus had to be seriously dehydrated with thickened blood and imbalanced electrolytes causing a decrease of oxygen to the body's cells an increased buildup of carbon dioxide and waste resulting in agonizing cramping and perhaps a bit more mercifully, some numbing and paralyzing. Earlier, they had offered him a mixed drink of wine with myrrh and gall, a somewhat pain-numbing narcotic mixture, but Jesus had refused it. Surely he was incredibly thirsty already at that point, but he refused it. The only explanation could be that he was unwilling to endure anything less than the full horror of the sins of the world with all his faculties intact. Now, nearly six hours later, not just because he is thirsty, but rather to fulfill the words of the scripture, Jesus declares his thirst. And can there be any doubt among those witnessing this scene that Jesus is fulfilling the very words of the psalmist, which he had echoed moments prior, my my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Later on in the psalm we read, My strength is dried up like a broken piece of pottery, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws, and thou dost lay me in the dust of death. The psalm seems as if it had been written with the crucified one in mind, and indeed it was. And he would be incredibly parched and thirsty before his death. And in declaring so, he fulfills yet another of those innumerable clues which make it clear that this is the Christ, and this is the fulfillment of these words. Lord Jesus, because of your thirst, teach us to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Amen. We sing stanzas 13 through 15. Jesus, in your thirst and pain, while your wounds your lifeblood drain, thirsting more our love to gain, hear us, holy Jesus. Thirst for us in mercy still, all your When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Uttered in torment, 
The word in Greek is a single word, just one. See it as a cry of victory, though. Jesus has now fully accomplished all that the Father had sent him to do. He had done the work of the suffering servant who would bear the sins of the world. He had not shrunk back from completing and fulfilling all that the Father had given him to do from drinking all of the cup he was to drink. All was now complete. Having been hung on a cross of wood, Jesus had become a curse for us as God's word had declared, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. As our substitute and curse bearer, Jesus willingly fulfilled all that was necessary to gain our deliverance our forgiveness. The apostle could write by the power of the Spirit, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our trespasses against us. He became sin who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Having borne the agonizing torment bodily of scourging and crucifixion, having borne the torment of the frightful weight of our sin, and of separation from his Father, and indeed hell itself, Jesus had completed everything the Father had given him to do. Thus he says it, it is finished, completed, fulfilled. Dear Jesus, thank you for bringing everything necessary for our saving to completion. Amen. We sing stanzas 16 through 18. From Luke we read, It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that assembled for the spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance, watching these things. With these words from Psalm 31 on his lips, Jesus finally lays down his life. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit and fulfilled all that the Father had given him to do. In a divine signal that no further sacrifice was needed, the heavy veil in the temple sanctuary separating off the most holy place was torn in two from top to bottom. This was significant, for the heavy veil prevented the ordinary priests, or anyone else for that matter, from looking upon the most holy place, for only the high priest could enter through it, and only then on the Day of Atonement, when the sacrificial blood was sprinkled. But now the sacred presence and place of God was opened, laid bare as if by a divine hand, at his son's death, for the true once-for-all-time atoning sacrifice was complete. Open access for the sinner. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, the Apostle John would write, and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. As Luke would later report in Acts chapter 6, a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Perhaps 
there's some of the source about this key knowledge regarding the veil. Regardless, the Lamb of God has indeed taken away the sins of the world. He has completed the task for which he had come into the world, and his spirit now returns to God who gave it. And after committing his spirit into the Father's hands, Jesus gave up his spirit. Ooh, do not miss the importance of those words and how they say it. Nobody killed Jesus. He gave up his spirit. Reminding us as well that Jesus said that no man takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord as the good shepherd does for his sheep. With all complete, he could lay it down, entrusting himself into his father's hands. And in the midst of mortal agony, yet in peace and assurance of his father's love and faithfulness, he yields his breath and bows his head. And in so doing, he not only paves the way for us, to lie down and close our eyes in peace, but he teaches us with words, trusting in him, to commend ourselves into our loving Father's hands. Lord Jesus, teach us in all of life, and most certainly in death, to commit ourselves into our Father's hands. Amen. We sing stanzas 19 through 21 of the hymn. Jesus, all your labor vast, all your 